Hey, Robert. Hey, Yaron. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm. I'm actually. It's in spite of the fact that a hurricane hit Puerto Rico. Um, I'm pretty good because I'm all the way over in Korea. Missed you by a little bit. Uh, yeah. So you moved to Puerto Rico right after Maria, and now the first time you leave, you know, post pandemic, there's a hurricane. So <laughs> I think that. Puerto Rican authorities should lock you in a room for August, September. Oh uh, I, I think so. Going you know, forward. Since exactly clearly, five years. Clearly exactly a hurricane years. rebellion. Yeah. It's uh, actually Hurricane Maria. I remember sitting in a hotel room with my wife watching the hurricane. Uh, I think we were, in, we were in Copenhagen or something. September is typically a month that we travel. So, um, and I think I think it's going to be a month that we traveled in the future as well. <laughs> Leaving my wife to deal with a hurricane by herself is not a good plan. Oh come on, it's just a category one. It's just a baby yeah, hurricane. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. well, you, you can tell her that in person. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, we were going to talk today about some of the uh, positive developments that have happened in the world, and and hurricanes actually lead kind of pretty well into this. I mean, hurricanes. In the past, in in the more distant past, I mean, they can be pretty devastating today. But typically, not a lot of people die when a hurricane hits. Um, I was just in Japan, where Category Four hurricane hits south, southern Japan, and and Japan will be fine after this. And and it's 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 striking how wealth makes it possible for you to fortify yourself against nature, which is in nature, in spite of the myth. It's not very hospitable to human beings. <laughs> no, mostly nature wants to kill us. <laughs> yeah. uh, actually, nature doesn't want anything. It's easy yes. to personify it, but uh, yeah. nature is completely indifferent. And given our fragile uh, physiology, yeah, basically trying to kill us all the time. But yeah. that is, I think it's, it's really neat how things have evolved because there's so many unplanned or non-core spillovers. Uh, to uh, benefits. So, mm -hmm. you know, the first satellites are sent up basically because it's a, a, a big swinging dick contest between the uh, Soviet yep. Union and the United States. Mm -hmm. But then suddenly you have this completely different perspective on the world that allows you to track and predict hurricanes. Yep. Now, I'm sure that the original weather satellites were not very good, but even you know, if it comes over the horizon, you you have what fifteen minutes. You have an advantage, uh, yeah. But if it, yeah. if you can see it even fifteen hours away, it makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. And no one was planning. Oh, let's make hurricanes a lot less deadly uh, when we started developing space technology. But that's one of the very clear impacts. And and I don't think I'm sure the first buildings made of concrete and 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 everything else. You know, the is 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 just wealth tends to make us safer. It, it tends to, to make us more resilient. It increases resilience across the whole spectrum. And, and there's a reason why life expectancy is, is higher and why child mortality is lower. And, and uh, across the board, we just live in a place that's we can cope with, uh, with a very dangerous nature out there. Well, we actually get pissed off. Like hurricanes were a way of life and people died and it was tragic, but now we expect, you know, this kind of stuff shouldn't happen, which mm -hmm. is a great attitude because next step might be, you know, weather controlling satellites where you can uh, just divert it enough so it goes north of the island or south of the island instead of right over the island. That would be so cool. That would be so cool. But so, it, you know, so th this, that's one aspect of kind of the, the wealth and the prosperity we have. But now we can actually start not just tinkering with nature out there but we can start tinkering with our own bodies to make them to make them more efficient and uh and, and so you just had you now have bionic eyes i mean this yeah, is so cool i've been wearing glasses for a decade much to my wife's dismay yeah uh, she basically told me once maybe 10 years ago that i look good in glasses and i was like oh cool i could stop wearing contacts <laughs> uh because you know when you have kids it's just a hassle and sure. uh but I've had terrible eyesight since I was about eight. And I got evaluated for LASIK surgery, which I thought would be a miracle, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago. And it, and it really was a miracle. There was a time where um, obviously corrective lenses 
are a miracle. Mm -hmm. uh, but there was a time where you basically had no choice but to live with your uh, deteriorating eyesight. And then there were a few technologies before LASIK, but really LASIK was the only one, uh, was the first one that was a, just a slam dunk, no brainer. Oh my God, let's do this. And everyone started doing it and it took off and uh, it got cheaper and it got better. And now it's almost like a rite of passage. If you have bad eyesight, you're like, oh, where am I gonna get LASIK? And you get LASIK three or four times if your eyesight continues to deteriorate. Uh, but I wasn't a great candidate for LASIK um, given my eyes. And so, I looked at some of the options and they're all basically, there are a lot of trade-offs. So uh, particularly even LASIK, if you have, if you're nearsighted, like I was, mm -hmm. uh, then you can get your vision corrected so you can see far away very clearly, but then you can't see, you basically change nearsightedness for farsightedness. So nobody wants to do that. So originally they would correct one eye for distance and one eye for up close and you would lose depth depth perception and your brain adjusts very quickly. It's, it's pretty miraculous. Uh, and then they developed, you know, eyeglasses that are not bifocals, but are continuous. Mm -hmm. And they develop contacts that you can correct near and far, like all of this, but it's all like a bandaid on, on the problem. Uh, and I, I just wasn't interested in that. If, if that's what I needed, then I'd be happy wearing, you know, glasses that were progressive and I could see pretty well. And, uh, my wife just had to suffer through it. But it turns out that um, in a development that was originally to treat cataracts, there are bionic lenses. They're, they're basically medical devices that replace the lens in your eye. And the lens in your eye is what, where you get cataracts. It's, it's, mm -hmm. You're born with it very clear uh, and hope, perfectly shaped. And then over time, it, it may distort and then you need vision correction. But almost certainly over time, much later in life, you know, in people's 60s or 70s or 80s, it starts to get cloudy. And, and obviously it's on your eyes. So if it gets cloudy, it really impacts your vision. And so these were developed to replace the lens that had gotten cloudy in order to uh, give you full sight again. But once you're replacing a lens for the cataract, the natural question is, well, how do we make this a corrective lens? And so that became a thing. And actually when my parents had cataract surgery, they stopped wearing glasses for the first time. But okay. it was the same issue of you can, how do you get near and far? Uh, and so only relatively recently has it become possible to get bionic eyes where you can focus far and near. And my surgery was uh, last, Thursday. And so I'm only four days in, three days in, five days in. Yeah. Uh, but it was, it's, and, and so it's a progression. And the first day I couldn't see anything because I had my eyes closed most of the day. Uh, but I can already tell that, you know, I have better eyes than I've had in 50 years. Wow. That's amazing. That's amazing. It really so no, amazing. so, so it, how does it, how does it actually focus in and out? How does it know what you want to see? Well, what happens, why, why people need reading glasses is the lens, in addition to getting distorted and getting cloudy, it loses its flexibility mm -hmm. over time. So as you get older, it gets harder to, to focus in on near because the muscles in your eye aren't getting stronger. They're getting weaker and the lens is getting less flexible. So that combination, eventually everyone needs reading glasses or bifocals or progressives or something. Mm -hmm. And so all they had to do is make this lens super flexible so that it, it, it can be distorted in the way that your eye naturally distorts to change the focus from near to far. Uh, now the lenses in my eye, uh, you could not get in the United States 18 months ago. Okay. Uh, so they're, they're the newest, greatest, but I bring that up because you could get them in Europe. <laughs> yeah. So when I went in to get evaluated, they said, well, we can, we can fix this, but if you wait a year, you can get something that's significantly better. It's been approved in Europe. It's, it's in thousands of eyes in Europe. It's, it's just not approved in the US. And my first thought was, yay, I get to wait because I did not want to have eye surgery. I'm a, I'm a coward about things like that. Uh, but then my second thought was, what the, like, we're requiring that thousands, tens of, I don't know the number, but, but many Americans get a second rate surgical yep. medical device we're, we're requiring them to get second rate we're not allowing them to get the best 
So they're, they're getting their eyeballs cut open and they're not getting all the benefits they could get out of that. And that pissed me off. Um, and so I waited, obviously. And, you know, I probably could wait another three years and get something even better, but I'd probably have to fly to Europe to get it. Yeah, and we see this with so many treatments that are approved in one jurisdiction and not available in the other. And, uh, you know, jurisdictions that are very similar in terms of their standards. Uh, there's not a big difference between the FDA and the European um, regulatory agencies or the uh, Canadians or the Australians or whatever. I mean, basically, the, the, the first world pretty much has the same standards. And yet, it has to be our agency that approves it. We, we, we can't rely on them, those, you know, Europeans. God forbid. And as a consequence, or, everybody's or, progress. Or speed good. our agency up, right? Like it would yeah, be or, okay if we were always first. Yeah. To yeah I'm not sure yeah. I want that. Like I, I don't mind the Europeans trying it for a little while, but <laughs> yeah, it's, it's crazy. Yeah, we saw it during COVID. We saw it, um, I, I, I think we see it with cancer treatments. We see it with all kinds of treatments. So, I mean, the good thing is we live in the United States, so we are indeed often first because a lot of the medical innovation happens here. And the FDA gets a, a first shot at it, but the FDA is slow. And uh, a lot of people know that. So even when something's developed in the US, they sometimes shop it around and, and, and get other regulatory agencies to get it first, which is just has tragic consequences. I mean, for you, it's optional. You didn't have to do it. You could have stayed with us. Totally. It's no big deal. Yeah, it's totally but like it. So many medical treatments are not optional. It's, uh, and, it, 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 and, and the fact that waiting costs lives. And we're lucky because a lot of the clinical trials do happen here. Yep. Yep. Uh, and so it would, in, in a case where it would, would be a life issue, uh, issue of life or death, it is possible to get into clinical trials, but it's like a crapshoot or who you know. I mean, it's really, yeah. uh, so the, I know that you had uh, back surgery and got a, a, I don't know, for some people, controversial treatment. Um, with stem cells. And as I understand it, it's not easy to get that anymore. No, and my doctor won't do it again. I was the, it was the only patient he's ever done it on. He won't do it again because it's not approved by the FDA. And, um, and, and what did he do, right? This is a controversial stem cells. He used my stem cells. Um, not very good stem cells because they were 50-year-old stem cells, but better than no stem cells. And he took them out of my bone marrow, uh, injected them um, in, um, into... Uh, where my disc had been, uh, and uh, they have regrown a disc. So, so it it it's truly phenomenal. What is the results? We we did an MRI a year later, and he was shocked at how successful it was. But funnily enough, he's he hasn't done it again. I mean, this should be the regular treatment for 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 disc problems, but it's not approved. Uh, there's constant battle about uh, stem cells in the United States for some reason. Even stem cells you use yourself. There was a a lot of court cases around knees, knee surgery, uh, and, and knee stem cells. And I'm sure there's some charlatans out there who use all kinds of gimmicky and stuff. But part of the reasons the charlatans is because it's not approved. So people cut corners and find a way. So if you really want stem cell treatment, uh, you have to go to places like Panama. Panama has a huge, uh, all American doctors who have developed the technology in the U.S., but can't do it in the U.S. So they, they go and they have built a clinic in Panama. Or you go to Europe, a place like Switzerland, where, um, do you remember, what's the football player? Pey uh, Peyton Manning, the, the quarterback. Uh, he had a, a, a problem in his disc in his neck. And um, the only place he could get stem cell treatment was Switzerland. So he went to Switzerland and had it done there. Yeah, so so it's miraculous results. And yep. you have to be Peyton Manning to get them. And, and it's not... Yeah. I mean, everything in medicine is expensive, but it's not that crazy expensive. It's taking stem cells out, preparing them properly and putting them in the right spot. I mean, my, I had to pay cash because the insurance wouldn't cover it because it's not FDA approved. Um, but I think it was $5,000. But um, hey, given the alternatives um, and, and given the alternatives for insurance companies that the FDA had approved it, it would actually lower insurance rates because the $5,000 paid for this, this was outpatient. It was quick, easy. Five thousand dollars is a steal, because a few years earlier I had had fusion. That meant almost a week in hospital, massive, big surgery. You know, big, lots of people. It cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. So the five thousand dollars is a is an unbelievable deal. Um, For much and, better results. 
and much, much better results and a lot less painful and a lot less uh, long-term in terms of the consequence of long-term, huge differences. So uh, it, it really is um, amazing the technology that's available and yet one can only imagine what would be available and what's out there at the margins uh, that could be available almost immediately if, if our regulatory regime either did not exist in its current form um, or, or was, was friendlier to actual customers, patients than it is today. And you know, we have, we have a, a particular perspective on this and an opinion uh, that I think is the only reasonable opinion, but yep. uh, I, I can understand people that want to disagree. And in cases of elective surgery, where there might be some issues that we haven't thought through, Okay, I'd be willing to engage in that conversation, but a lot of progress right now is being uh, made on things that are life or death. Uh, you know, we've yeah. we've been talking about curing cancer for I don't know, probably a hundred years. Uh, there have been serious talk about curing cancer for at least fifty years because it's been mm -hmm. basically my whole lifetime. Yeah. Um, Joe Biden has come out about there's going to be a moonshot Apollo program. We're going to cure yeah. cancer, uh, and um, you know, all of the attempts to cure cancer so far, and until recently, and by recently, I mean basically the last 20 years, uh, have been based on traditional medicine. And traditional medicine is where you give a chemical, a drug, that then performs the action that is necessary. So for cancer, it's basically chemotherapy, and it's um, some kind of poison that will mm -hmm will be worse for cancer cells than it will be for the other cells. But of course, it's also terrible for the other cells. So it's, mm -hmm. it violates the Hippocratic Oath. And I totally understand why doctors do it because the alternative is dying. Like we're talking about life or death, yeah. but it's yeah. horrible. And, and doctors hate the toxicity of any sort of treatment. Uh, and so when you, you look at cancer research today, there's, they're not looking for better chemotherapeutics. Uh, that was, you know, for a long time, that was trying to get fewer side effects and more efficacy. Uh, but always with this massive trade-off. Uh, now they're looking for how do we harness the body's existing mechanism for uh, dealing with cancer? Because we all are dealing with cancerous cells ongoingly mm -hmm. inside of our bodies because mutations happen. And you know our bodies are, we've evolved to be able to kill off cancerous cells. And when we actually get cancer is where the body comes up short. And it, that's... It is, the mechanism is not understood, you know, why in any given case the body comes up short, but we know it happens. Yeah. Uh, and we know it happens in more in some societies. We know it happens more as people age. It, it makes a lot of sense. And if the body is already good at taking your cancer, can we just give it a little more, uh, a little help, you know, somehow catalyze that? Uh, so and this is called immunotherapy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, immunotherapy, it, it was, it began as very similar to traditional um, medicine, where you're trying to find a molecule that the immune system will, with it will, will help empower the immune system to identify and, and link and then slaughter the cancer cells. Yep. Um, small molecule uh, immunotherapies, it can be really amazing. Uh, but the ones that are are really going to change the game. And I think much faster than people think are the immunotherapies that are designed much mm -hmm. you know, like your T your, like your stem cells where you use your stem cells to treat your body, where uh, the treatments are designed using patients own T cells. Uh, and that, that's already happening. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's, and some of the results are miraculous. They're stumbling around in the dark because uh, we only recently reached a point where we can treat biology. Like, it, it, biology is digital, like there are base yeah. pairs in the DNA. It's, but it's super complicated because it's not binary. Uh, yep. But we're at a point where you can actually start designing different treatments and testing them. And, and in particular, finding the ones that work for particular cases. And that is, is where... It, it will be like being able to change the trajectory of a hurricane. 
uh, where you get a cancer, you, your own immune system is then designed, it's engineered to take care of that cancer and that cancer is eradicated without any cutting, without any radiation, without any chemotherapy, Chemo, without yep. you know, all the things that, that we relate to how you would cure cancer. Now, we spent decades trying to cure cancer by cutting people, by shooting them with radiation, by poisoning them, uh, because we didn't know any better. Mm -hmm. uh, and I am, I am, you know, I, I think it's great that the federal government is now trying to get behind this. Uh, it, I, I worry about how they get behind it because we've had these, we're going to cure cancer before. And all we yep. did was go farther down the wrong path. And this may be the wrong path, but you know, short term, it's definitely the right path. There may be something better someday, you know, the, the Star Trek wave it over people and they just get better well, but for now. This is I mean what we want what we want is the same thing we want in any technology what we want is experimentation and and people to try different things and and this might be it and it probably is but you, you want to be able to have the some the, you know some of the more marginal crazy scientists say hey but I've got a different way of doing it and 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 give them the freedom to be able to do that you know they, we don't want to we don't want to uh, uh, do it at the expense of people's lives, but but there are ways to do this and ways to do it properly in the science community. I, I've always been impressed by how seriously they take the ethics of it. It doesn't have to be imposed on them. These are, I mean, you know, doctors. Uh, I know doctors. My father was a doctor. I mean, these are not people that 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 out. Oh, I you know, I'm I'm going to abuse people in order to find a cure, or whatever. Yeah, these I've are been to medical school like, for eight years, so I can yeah. you know abuse people you can abuse people a lot easier. yeah i mean these these are some of the these are responsible adults and 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 they they love what they do and they're in it to cure people that's that's why they're in the, the profession so it, it, allowing them the kind of experimentation and and the freedom to figure this out that's the moonshot the moonshot is is providing the resources to and the freedom i think more than anything kind of the regulatory freedom we saw that with with vaccines right you give them a little bit of freedom and they can produce a vaccine in a year. Nobody thought that was possible. But if the FDA had used the regular path, it would have taken five years. Um, and and if 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 we really want cancer, uh, these cancer treatments to to you know to move fast, what they need is is uh, is the freedom to be able to use ingenuity and to um, to experiment to and and to fail and to learn from it. But yes, I mean, it's making progress at a, at a pace that is truly astounding because it looks like this is the right approach. I, th I think we talked about this, uh, what was it? I think it was colon cancer where they, where, where they did this immuno, this uh, individual specific immunotherapy on 20 patients and um, all 20. So complete remission, um, no chemo, no radiation, no surgery. Uh, on a on a uh, on a very in a, on a cancer that usually requires tons of all three of those and is very very horrible in terms of the the kind of the kind of uh, outcome of the treatment here it was almost painless in terms and we're of, seeing uh, that where trials have to get canceled because it, the yeah. doctors can't justify having a control group yep uh, because the treatment is working so well but you know, when you said this is maybe it, the the thing that I think we need experimentation is we don't even know what it is. Like yes. we we know that that uh, T cells are important, but we really don't know, and it's all empowered by CRISPR. You know, you, you couldn't have done this without the CRISPR technology, yeah. Yeah. and it doesn't have the it hasn't gotten a um, some ludite crazy backlash because we're changing the genetics of and i think that's because it's a life or death situation and yeah. in those types of cases uh, people are willing to be a lot more rational like okay this is better than yeah. knowing you're going to die my fear is, is is we're already starting to created in the same way that we have in the past, even calling it a moonshot. A moonshot was, you know, the Apollo program was not experimentation. No. And it's so obvious today when you compare how NASA is, is doing versus <laughs> how SpaceX is doing yeah. that the Apollo model worked and it was really a miracle that it worked. 
uh, versus the ingenuism model, which basically always works. You just never know what it's going to look like. And you have a lot of failure along the way. And yep. failure is tough in, in life or death situations. Uh, if you think about autonomous driving, you know, I, yeah. I drove a Tesla early on and it was very clear to me early on that the, the, uh, the self-driving system, the autopilot system was a better driver than I was, yeah. um, particularly in certain circumstances, but it was very clear. And now people have died because of autopilot but a couple order of magnitudes, more people have died because <laughs> we didn't have autopilot. Yep. And that's my fear is that we'll try and protect one person while sacrificing 10. And you know, we saw that over and over in COVID, the sacrifice wasn't always life. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the problem is, you know, we'll sacrifice the future of our, our children because we don't want grandma to die. Uh, that, that is my concern is that we we eventually crack down on this because oh you know it's it's something it's always it's usually the children but in covid it wasn't it was grandma yeah no i agree completely and it's it's that is that is the real risk and we're seeing it and and the, the challenge with the new cancer treatments is that the science the basic science understanding of the immune system is not quite there yet. So we're going to have some failures. I mean, the beauty of it is that as we're learning more about the science, we're, we're, we're developing the technologies to match. And you can really see this beautiful interaction between science, basic research, and 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 technology, and, and the technologies that it's based on. We saw that, obviously, with the development of microchips and, and so on, but you're seeing now it, in biology as we've learned more about how our body works. And... Uh, so they're going to be failures, and uh, that's just part of part of you know gaining knowledge. And uh, if if the system doesn't tolerate failure, that will be a disaster. That will be a real disaster. And I'm really encouraged by the fact that this is a bridge to gene therapy. I mean, we've been talking about gene therapy for decades. Yeah. And the problem with gene therapy is you're jumping from from the the chemo world where you're giving drugs that you can at least understand and, and you can observe the mechanism and you can likely get the dosage right. You, you don't understand the long-term side effects. You, you are creating problems down the road, but you at least have mm -hmm. some visibility to gene therapy where you're like, well, we think this gene is important and we're going to tri trip and you know, clip it out and hope for the best. Uh, and there's no predictability there, but with the immunotherapies that we're looking at today, it's, it's in the middle because mm -hmm. there is this problem. There is this problem of when you fuck with the immune system, bad things can happen. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, you know, that, that was what was most caused most of the fatalities of COVID uh, is the immune system getting into some sort of cascade that it, it was damaging the body itself. So messing with the immune system is, is, is dangerous. And it's incredibly powerful. Uh, and the nice thing is you can do it in the early experiments and the early trials and the early treatments and early maybe for, for years or even decades, but you can do it with people in the hospital on a monitor where you can see any sort of impact that's happening in real time because this isn't the kind of damage that builds up or toxicity that's gonna you know, give you liver or heart problems down the road. It's a, the immune system is getting out of court. You can dial it back. You can offer other treatments that will suppress the immune reaction, but not make you immune compromised. Like it's a, it's, there's a lot more power and a lot more uh, predictability, despite the mm -hmm. fact that it's extremely cutting edge and extremely um, hard to know what's going to work and what's not going to but the failures will be smaller and the wins will be bigger than in gene therapy which basically has gone nowhere and has killed people here we're going to save a lot of lives and unfortunately we're going to kill some people yeah and and from that we're going to learn more so that i think uh, the future of gene therapy is still very positive it's just a matter of this might be the bridge the knowledge, we're going to gain knowledge that allow us to do that much better in the future. It's definitely going to be a step in that direction. So this is very exciting. So um, thanks, Robert. Enjoy your uh, bionic eyes. I am loving them. It's That's weird, great. though, because every time I go to bed, because my eyes are still a little sore because, you know, they yeah. were stabbed just a few days ago, yeah. uh, is, is my eyes are a little sore and I can see. And so my first thought is I have to take my contacts out. And then I wake up and I can see, and my first thought is, I 
Oh, shoot, wear my glasses. I my contacts in. No, because I can see, but yeah. then I realize my eyes don't hurt because you, if you've slept in contacts, it's just yeah. a bad idea. But I'm going to enjoy That's them a lot and I'm going to get to enjoy great. them for decades. No cataracts, bionic eyes. This is awesome. Yeah, I mean, it, and it, you know, this is a good place to end. You know, what else can we replace with bionic stuff? I mean, uh, this, this opens up all kinds of opportunities. Well, in the same way, I mean, yours, it was even better because it was grown yeah. from your own body, but you yeah. have a bionic back. Um, yeah. Our accountant has had two knee surgeries. They were 10 years apart. And then it was like night and day. One was yeah. horrible and the other was outpatient. Uh, you know, if, if we let, if we let ingenuism work, uh, even old guys like us, we're going to have a very different uh, elderhood than our parents did because we're going to be bionic. Cool. Looking forward to it. I am too. <laughs> Thanks, Travels, you're on. Thank you. Bye. Bye.